Good afternoon, and welcome to Cumberland Strategies Women in Politics speaker series. I'm so excited to introduce today's guest, my aunt Karen Taylor. She currently serves as the chair of Service New Brunswick and runs her own consulting firm in Atlantic Canada. On today's episode, we talk about resilience and what it means to be a woman working within politics. I'm very excited to impart her wisdom with you, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. <laughs> Going through Karen, who I call Pippi, because when I was younger, I could not pronounce Kippy, which is her other nickname, your resume, and I couldn't do it justice if I were to provide a synopsis of it. And I wondered if you wanted to provide a brief background for our audience as to who you are and why we are so privileged to have a New Brunswicker on our panel. Well, thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, it's lovely to be here, and I really appreciate the offer to be part of what sounds like a fascinating program, and congratulations to you and your colleagues for starting it. Um, a little bit about me. Well, let's see. Let's start at the beginning of the beginning. I uh, grew up <laughs> in a little town in Woodstock, like Mackenzie did, Woodstock, New Brunswick. At the time, I think there were about 4,000 people there. Um, still are. Uh, <laughs> well, there might be 4,500 now, well, who knows? Um, but anyway, um, and I grew up, I was an only child for about uh, 11 years until Mackenzie's dad uh, came along and that was a joyful day for me. Um, I was raised by two wonderful parents who uh, really taught me the value of being the best person you can be. And also as I got a little bit older to give back to the community, because I remember my mother telling me that a community was really only as effective and good as the people who contributed to it. So that's been sort of a, if I can call it a byline throughout my life. And I've been involved in, in lots of things, but I also learned early on to be involved with things that made a difference to me where I felt that I could actually make a difference. I attended Woodstock schools. Um, and I went to, started at the University of New Brunswick in the ripe year of 1968. Um, I thought I had, you know, died and gone to heaven because I was in a city and I was in a, a women's residence where I made lots of friends and I loved uh, the university atmosphere. So I graduated from there with a Bachelor of Arts and um, offered a job with the New Brunswick Human Rights Commission. And I worked as a human rights officer uh, where I did investigations and conciliations for a number of years, but was always fascinated by the opportunity to prevent discrimination. And um, it, it was at a time, if one can believe it, that uh, sexual discrimination had only recently been added to the Human Rights Act um, uh, at, before I, I joined. And I love the work. I love the opportunity to make a difference. And then I became fascinated by prevention education. And I was offered a job by the Human Rights Commission um, Commissioner, Chief Commissioner. And so I did that for a number of years. And that, that was really rewarding because I learned a lot about systemic discrimination. I learned about the value of looking to the good that people can share uh, in a workplace. Um, especially, and uh, to look at the whole person, not that the skin color or the gender or whatever. And that may sound trite, but that was a really fabulous learning experience. And I went from uh, the human rights business, as I call it, uh, and I was the director of education for the Human Rights Commission in New Brunswick. And then um, I had all <laughs> along the same time I was doing this stuff, I was also involved in the community to carry that thread through. And um, I was invited to uh, join the Canadian Paraplegic Association Board for New Brunswick. And um, I went from there to the national board and whatnot mm -hmm. and, and love fundraising. So I helped them raise money as a volunteer. And then the president of St. Thomas University, which is a, a, a small university in Fredericton, Mackenzie knows it well. Uh, mm -hmm. I had um, graduated from there after UNB with a certificate in social work. So the president had approached me and asked me if I would consider chairing a committee to um, uh, head a, um, a fundraiser uh, and a community event for St. Thomas to celebrate its 90th anniversary. It had never really done anything in the public sphere, which I found interesting. 
So the only two provisos that I had when I was asked uh, what I needed to make this happen, I said, I would like whatever money we raise to go toward a bursary for uh, students in financial need, because sometimes it was a matter of only a few hundred dollars between going to university and not. And then uh, the other thing that I had asked for was that I'd be able to put a team together of my own friends and colleagues, as well as people from St. Thomas. So the president agreed to both of those and our event was held. And I think we raised that night $55,000, which was pretty good wow. for 2000, the year 2000. <laughs> and Natalie McMaster was our star performer. She was a friend of the Bishop. St. Thomas is a Catholic university. I'm not Catholic, so that was always an interesting experience for me. <laughs> and uh, that um, Millennium Bursary Fund, I think, is now in the millions of dollars. So that's something I was really proud of because um, it gave people an opportunity to see what a great university St. Thomas was. It was a sellout crowd. I think we had 450 people there or something. It was a black yeah. tie dinner. And um, so, you know, not to belabor your question, but I went from there. I, I basically, I, I guess that was my first retirement. Uh, how many times have I She's retired? Had several I You've had several retirements. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the word retirement, actually. I think no. it's better that you re reinvent yourself and, um, and uh, keep on doing what you love. So um, I, somewhere in between all of that, I went to Europe a couple of times. I uh, lived in Europe for three months, I guess, after I graduated from university the first time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then I went to NB Power. I was, a, I guess, what did they call me? A human resources specialist. <laughs> I set up a, a company, a consulting business in 1994. And uh, I do human resources and organizational development work. And that takes me, I love strategic planning. And um, so I volunteer a lot of my time for not-for-profits. I'm just doing something here locally for Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And I've been on a lot of boards and uh, I love the engagement uh, of being on a board. And probably that experience is where I've learned the most about not only people's behavior and interaction, but also making connections and, um, and just, I guess, learning. And sometimes I, I remember being on boards and I was the only woman. Um, luck, hopefully it's a little <laughs> bit different today, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I'm just delighted to be with you. I could tell you a lot more and you know a lot more about me, Mackenzie. And but that's kind of I a snapshot that. in the sense of when opportunity arises, I'm the person that will usually say, why, why not? Rather than, yeah. you know, why would I, right? Let's I was, that I was telling my colleagues, definitely. I was telling my colleagues that growing up, it was never what if, it was why not? And that was always the mentality with you. And uh -huh. I feel very fortunate to have been raised with strong female leaders. Otherwise, I don't know if I would be where I am today without that guidance. And I kind of wanted to track it back to the human rights element. And you talk about how at that point that you started at the Human Rights Commission, discrimination on the basis of sex was just established by law. And you know, in New Brunswick, there's a mentality that female politicians, um, it's hard to get into politics in New Brunswick because there are preconceived notions of what a woman's role is. And I know that has evolved, but as the director of education, what was it like communicating that to New Brunswickers? Was there a communication strategy and how has that shifted, do you think, within the political landscape? You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this this morning in preparation for mm -hmm. your interview. I remember going into um, one of New Brunswick's largest employers at the time and meeting with the, the then CEO. And we had uh, several cases where, and not all women, you know, who witness discrimination or experience that would come forward with a complaint because sometimes they'd be frightened that they would lose their jobs and even to have a woman in the workforce back in the day was a big deal but i remember the issue was um that this employer and was known for it didn't hire women who were of um uh, childbearing age and so we uh, i used to love i love investigating anything and i used to love looking at the systemic nature of an organization to figure out what was really going on so i thought well best way to figure out is to meet the ceo so i did and i remember <laughs> it like it what is today and it wasn't today trust me it was a long time ago 
and I remember sitting there and, and, you know, being cordial and explaining why I was there and all this kind of stuff. And it didn't take him very long to turn around and tell me that, well, why would, why would I spend money hiring somebody, a, a woman who was going to get pregnant and then not be at work? And it was not uh, an uncommon point of view at the time. So yeah, while things may today. seem a bit abysmal today, uh, I think they have changed in some respect, but I, I don't know the degree to which it has changed. Over the years, I uh, have seen uh, young women like yourself and your colleagues um, really show an interest in, in making a difference and not focusing not so much on the negative, but look at, at, at the educational opportunity and also looking at the value of sharing uh, with other people. You know, in, in my work life, I have been very fortunate in that I had uh, not a lot, but I would say a number of mentors. And you know what? The majority of them were men in the mm -hmm. sense, what, and it makes sense because they would hold positions of power, right? Um, but, you know, they would give me opportunities to, th to do things, you know, like at the Human Rights Commission, uh, becoming the director of education. That really wasn't my idea. I was offered that job by the, the commissioner who then went on to become the speaker of the Senate, uh, uh, Noel or Senator Kinsella. I absolutely agree with you. Um, again, that notion still permeates the culture that I worked in and currently do work in, where it's not so much that you got that job at a merit, but clearly there were other reasons why. Right. Going back to mentorship, and I, I was telling my colleagues the other day too, I said a lot of my greatest mentors have been men. And I wondered what that was on one hand. Yes, it is because that men are typically in senior positions, but also I think there's a tendency for women to view other women as competition. And I know that's politics, that's business, that's law. Would you agree with that? Um, you know, I, I don't know if I can agree or disagree. If I look just at my own experience and probably partly because of my personality and my my determination, you know, goal setting mm -hmm. and getting things done, mm -hmm. um, I tend to always try to look at the, the value that anybody brings to a situation. Mm -hmm. I think there will always be people who will be and who will be envious of those that they perceive to be um, smarter or have more mm -hmm. opportunity or whatever. My preference has always been not to see people that way. It's not that I have blinders on, but I would prefer to see the opportunity in what could be rather than spending a lot of energy. Because for me, life is about time and energy and I pay more attention to it the older I get. But you know, it's to maximize those and to know that there will always be people there who will be like that. My mother taught me that when I was, uh, when I was a little girl because I was an only child. And you taught me that school. growing up. Yeah had more stuff than other kids, right? And my mm -hmm. mother, and I, this has also carried me through, and you've heard me talk about this, Ken's. My mother would say, if somebody, you know, one of the girls was a little mean, like in grade school or whatever, and she would just look very quietly and elegantly as she always did and say, mm -hmm. now, Karen or Kippy, you know, really Karen, mm -hmm. she said- Or, or Pippi. <laughs> <"What, laughs> yeah, what, yeah, or Pippi. <laughs> she would say, now, would you want to be, I'll make the name up, Anne. And I would say, oh, yeah. no, she's mean. And she said, well, I think she might want to be you. And she can't. So it kind of flips it around. And um, I'll just it just puts a different perspective on it. But that's my own, my, that's my own experience mm -hmm. and way of dealing with stuff. I mean, I've worked with men who are jealous of me, too. So it's not necessarily related. <laughs> to, <laughs> it's not so much a, just a, a gender thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Growing up, you have so many great stories. And I, I remember one of them being about a certain board that you became the first female chair of. And I remember you talking about the concerted effort to, to kind of, you know, ensure that process didn't happen and that role wasn't achieved. And I wondered if you could talk about that and perhaps lessons learned. And again, going through your resume, my jaw was on the ground almost the entire time I was reading it um, <laughs> of all the things that you've done. And you really are a trailblazer. And I wonder if you could talk about some stories throughout your career that have shaped you and, and certain things that perhaps tried to block you, but you persevered and you made it through. Well, thank you, Mackenzie, for, for saying that. Um, I, I really appreciate your comments. I will share something with you though, and your audience that um, I learned later in life 
Um, and it's something that uh, I think it's, I've shared it with a lot of, of, of mainly women basically. And I guess people in general, I tend to be one of those people that will see something as an opportunity, something like a goal setting or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll, I'll move toward that. And generally with a sense of fun, because if I'm not having fun doing something, it's probably not a good place for me. And you probably remember that growing up. Um, but I have, I didn't really ever stop and say, good job. I just kept moving on. So probably one of the reasons why uh, you didn't hear much maybe, or I didn't talk about some of the stuff that I did, two reasons. I was brought up at a time in the 1950s and 60s when it was uh, improper to be boastful, where girls were to be seen and not heard. Good luck bringing me up. Um, but it, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a way of, of being, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that Absolutely. when I did get into opportunities to do things, which I've always kind of done because I like being that way, but anybody who accomplishes stuff, like you've accomplished a lot, Mackenzie. And I think it's really great to be able to share that with people because I find with young women, and I love to mentor young women, uh, that story shared is like, yeah, I guess that's okay if I, and I said, yes, of course, because you're celebrating all the gifts that you have. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of my life, I just start there because, and I've taken way too much time to answer your question. But um, yeah, I, the, I think one of the, the, the memories that I, that I have, uh, and it was just a joyful experience for me. Um, I have a great interest in, in working with young people, uh, kids and, and young people, because I see a lot of young people today that perhaps don't have the opportunities that, that I would have had. And I don't mean financially. I just mean socially and with family and all that stuff. And uh, so I, I was asked to, to join the Boys and Girls um, Regional Board um, no, the New Brunswick board for Boys and Girls Clubs. And I think what they do is fabulous and I still do. And then I was asked to be on the regional board. And then um, I was asked to join the national board. Now the national board at Boys and Girls Clubs celebrated its hundredth anniversary in the year 2000. And um, I became uh, shortly before that, the first woman, in, woman president of the national board. And, and I was the first Atlantic Canadian. Now that doesn't mean the board had been around for a hundred years, it hadn't, but it had been around for a long time. And it was, you know, I think fairly male dominated by times. And it was always interesting because I could kind of hear people think like, who is she anyway? And how'd she get here and whatnot? <laughs> but it was one of the best experiences I'd ever had because I learned when I was a kid growing up the value of collegiality and always being yourself. And um, because sometimes I see people, they're kind of chameleon-like and they'll change depending on wherever they are. To me, that's uh, not being true to yourself. So anyway, I did that um, for three or four years. Great experience, met a lot of people. We celebrated the 100th anniversary of Boys and Girls Clubs in St. John, which was New Brunswick, which was the first club in the country and it was started in uh, 1900. So there was a rich history there. And we did all kinds of cool things. We had a stamp, uh, you know, a, a stamp that was created for us. And we had a coin, I think. And, uh, and that, was a, that was an experience that ended up in a very good place. It was, it was always a matter of stick handling and chairing meetings with people who were used to a, a whole different style, different gender as, as their chair. And at the end of the day, I think we, we came to a very good place. Uh, I led a national, uh, well, basically a strategic planning exercise that brought our board from over 30 people down to 12. And uh, that was not without its challenges, but from a governance standpoint, which is another area that fascinates me, it was the best thing to do because it was targeted to people who really cared about moving the organization forward. And it wasn't necessarily, you weren't on the board necessarily because you were from a region. As a matter of fact, we eliminated the regional basis and that worked very well too. Mm -hmm. um, not all my board experience has been that pleasant. There have been times, you know, where I knew kind of like, hmm, do we want you to be chair? No. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes that's okay. 
Because for me, it's always been about what you learn along the way. And I'm not the thickest skinned person in the world, but I always take the opportunity to sit back and say, okay, what did I learn from that? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a tough lesson to learn too. I mean, you've been there for me when I've gone through my own career trials and tribulations. And I think it is that self-assurance and knowing that you can conceivably get through something. And that idea that, you know, probably the worst that's ever going to happen to you has al already likely happened. It's interesting talking about resilience though, because I've always perceived you as one of the most resilient people in my life. And has, has there ever been an obstacle looking back where at the time it seemed like, you know what, maybe I'll just give up because I think a lot of people right now, I mean, I have felt it. It's hard, I'm not gonna do it. It's not worth my time. Has there been something in, that you know you've experienced where it was difficult, but you reflect and you say, thank goodness I did that because I learned an incredible lesson from that. My dad was a great guy. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was very, very smart. And he was, I think he almost had like a charismatic personality. I used to watch as a little kid, people being around him and, and just wanting to engage with him. My friends were like that. Your dad's friends were like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they called him Grampy. And he would always say to me, if stuff would happen, like even when I was growing up in high school or whatever, you know, in high school is high school, right? And he would say, you know, tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow's another day. And I used to think, oh, if I hear that one more time. But in actual fact, it was true that, you know, whatever the day brings, and it doesn't always bring roses and sunshines, sun, sunshine, you know that there will be another day coming where the sun may be shining just a little bit brighter. And that may sound a little bit like Pollyanna, but that's, um, I think to answer your question, that's kind of what always is in the back of my mind. Have there been times where I was disappointed? Yeah, I mean, there, there have been jobs that I wanted. I remember one job in particular, um, and I remember people saying when I, because I was a civil servant for 32 years, so I learned a lot about that environment. And people used to say, oh, Karen, I, you, must, you, you should be a deputy minister. And I used to say, why would I want to do that? And it was, you know, kind of like weird, but there were a couple of jobs. I remember I really at the time thought I wanted and I didn't so get do you, them. Can I, do you mind if I pause you right there? No. Cause that's interesting. Cause usually if someone in the civil service, I would imagine that's what they would aspire to be as a deputy minister or an ADM. So what about that didn't necessarily allure you? I yeah. love the variety of the work that I did. I could be in a board and I remember this being in a boardroom at Irving oil one day. And the next day I was at a school, little elementary school in Keswick Ridge, you know, which is a farming community outside of Fredericton. And, um, um, it just, it, I guess it, it just, it never really appealed to me. I, I was not so much interested in positions of power as I was in doing things where I could learn, share my skills. But the most important thing for me was always working with people who would value me as a person and what I could potentially offer and that I would learn from these people. And that's why I think one of the reasons I stayed with the Human Rights Commission for so many years was because I had that environment to work in. I went somewhere else one time where that didn't happen. And um, um, yeah, so anyway, I learned a lesson there, but it was a great lesson. And at the time I was disappointed, but when I look back, I thought, wow, that was not meant to be. The way it worked out was just yeah. the way it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that people, you know, and, and women who aspire to be deputy ministers and ADMs. And I, I mean, I think that's fabulous if that suits you, that mm -hmm. if that suits your desire and your need and, and what you need. Uh, it, in my case, it, I just didn't follow that path. Although I think I could have, I, I didn't choose to do that. Is there a female politician or someone within the political realm that you said, I want to be like her someday? And what were the qualities and attributes of her? Well, um, I, I think one of my favorite people of all time, and I regret that I never had the opportunity to meet her, but believe me, if, if, if she had been somewhere with what I could have been when I was a kid, I would have been right there. And that's Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> I have always, and you know this, always admired her for so many reasons. Um, she, she indeed was a trailblazer. Um, she did things in her time that I, I, I read so much about her life that I think that must have been almost in, unsur, insurmountable. But mm -hmm. she believed in what she was doing, her great love of human rights um, and so many other things.
that she would be internationally somebody that that I would look to. Um, and I think, you know, any any politician, any woman who has stepped into the political fray, if I can call it that, whether it's in Canada, the US or wherever, and I am so happy to see so many presidents and prime ministers now around the world as, as women, and they're young women, you know, just look, mm -hmm. I think at New Zealand, by example. Um, yeah. At, 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 you know, and I'm obviously I'm I'm interested in politics. I'm more interested probably in the political process and how people make decisions and what they do when they get in positions of power, as I am anything else. But um, you know, I I, uh, I I just think it's you know the Biden Harris team. I think is a great team. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, they're they're iconic. Yeah, I definitely agree. Eleanor Roosevelt would also probably be one of my favorites. There's this incredible story that after the New Deal had passed Congress, she went to every state in the United States of America and re report back to the White House, how is the New Deal practically affecting Americans? Right. And in the, during the war, they would have a, a phone line dedicated solely to Eleanor Roosevelt who would call in and complain about processes that were practically in fact impacting Americans. She was truly a trailblazer and I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. And, you know, I, I, I've read different articles that kind of alluded, one was let, more than alluding, they basically said the only mm -hmm. reason she had those positions of power was because of her husband. And mm -hmm. I, I would think if anything, that, that maybe was a deterrent for her, because it wasn't a very popular thing for wives of presidents to be so actively involved. They usually had a, a cause, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she had a cause, all right, and it was a worldwide one. And, you know, I just think it took, and she wasn't, you know, I, my impression of her was that she didn't need to be in the limelight, but she knew what she needed to do. And she was very strategic. And I think mm -hmm. if there's one skill that if someone doesn't have it naturally, that's a very important one to have. And that is to be a strategic thinker, be a broad based thinker and be strategic in terms of what you want, how are you going to get it, who needs to be involved. And, and in my case, it's always about making a, a positive difference somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be a big difference, you know, it can be something small, but the main thing is you're moving forward. Um, I wanna talk about the Celebration of Women Millennium Project Award that you were a recipient of. What were the events that led up to that? And what did it feel like to, to receive that award? Well, thank you for the opportunity to think about this because you know what, <laughs> this is typical. I haven't thought about this for a long time. I know I did send you, <laughs> I think an article or something, I don't know about it. Um, it this was um, a project. I wasn't involved in the initiation of the project, uh, but it was a millennium project. And um, a woman who is now a justice of the court here in New Brunswick, and I think a small group of her colleagues and friends um, put together a committee and the purpose was to celebrate women. I can't, you probably have the information there, but celebrate women who have made a difference or raised the bar or something like that in New Brunswick. And um, they, they contacted me and I was, my first question is always is, why are you contacting me? And, uh, and, but after we talked for a while, I was absolutely um, delighted and very honored to be included. And the event that they had a number of, um, uh, I think small events around the province, but the one that I remember uh, there, I think was a time capsule that uh, was buried. And we were actually, mm -hmm. each of us to put a little something in the time capsule. And uh, I think it's, it's along the, on Waterloo Row, which you know is a beautiful lined um, mm -hmm. uh, residential street in, in Fredericton along the, uh, the St. John River. And uh, so that, that was really fun. I have no idea when they're gonna dig it up. I suspect I won't be around when they do, but um, <laughs> it, it was going just- I to live for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I, I have a lot more trouble to cause. Um, but you know, it's, it, I think the thing that I loved about that initiative is that I can still remember us getting together and there was quite a large group. I tried to find the photograph for you, but of course I don't keep all my clippings and stuff. Um, and I thought this this fabulous, like we're actually getting together and just being happy to be with one another, right? 
because I, I think I don't think I'm the only woman who goes along and does stuff and just says, okay, let's move on to the next thing, right? So that mm -hmm. was um, that was absolutely wonderful to uh, to be included in that group. Amazing. It's interesting the photos you've sent. Some involve Frank McKenna, some involve Senator Kinsella. And one thing that I noted, and so did my colleagues, is that you were always the only female in all of these photos. And I wondered, how did that feel? I mean, did you really ever take the time to think to yourself, wow, I'm the only female? Or, or was it so inclusive that it really didn't feel as if your gender was even a consideration? Well, th thank you. Um, and it's, I, you know what? I have to tell you, when I, when I went through these, these clippings, I hadn't seen a lot of those for years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those clippings from early years, my father kept, right? I hadn't even kept them. So that kind of goes to my, I, I learned a lesson and actually you've been giving me a huge gift by allowing me and kind of forcing me to go back and, and look. But I did, when I did look at them, I thought, I am the only one. You were. <laughs> I am the only woman. <laughs> you know, that, whether it's good or it's bad, that never really much occurred to me. What did occur to me, like when I look at that photo of Frank McKenna, who was then the premier of New Brunswick and Senator, he was then a, a chairman uh, of the Human Rights Commission, Noel Kinsella, he wasn't a Senator. And the recipient of the Human Rights Award, Don Calder, a lovely, a lovely uh, teacher. And he was a member of our commission. And I got this idea one day, I was sitting there at work and I thought, we need to celebrate success. We need to celebrate in human rights and what. So I went about with the agreement of these guys uh, to set up a human rights award, which we established first time in 1988. And that photograph was from an event that I, I again, was given the okay to organize. I don't know, we had hundreds of people there showing up and some people said, how'd you get so many people? And I said, I just asked them, right? But it never <laughs> occurred to me that I, that I was the only woman. And you'll see other mm -hmm. photos where, and whether that's good or bad, um, I think because I didn't focus on that, I was just being me and doing things that I yeah. felt that I needed to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I never even saw myself as a leader. I, I just, I just, I felt I was compelled to do certain things because I thought they were important. And, so, and yeah, that goes back to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it's important though. I mean, you should be there because of your merit and Nothing else should be considered. You and I talked again, again in the context of governance, board governance specifically, about when women sometimes have a tendency, and we've seen it, and I can admit that I'm sure I have done it. Um, I'm more cognizant of it now, especially since we talked about it, but you get into a room full of men, and sometimes there's a tendency to adjust your behavior in a way that would be more suitable for that male-dominated environment. But you have always said, and I agree with you, being the most authentic version of yourself, because at some point someone will see through that. And in a, in a culture as uh, abrasive as politics, that's, that's really crucial and it's rare. And I value it in a lot of our political leaders, both female and male who, who can do that, manage to do that. One of the things that has carried me through a lot of good times and some dips you know, throughout life that we all have is I, and I'm never shy about saying this, I have a lot of self-confidence. That's not to say mm -hmm. I'm haughty. I mean, I, I was a little nervous about even doing this today, you know, I mean, because we're just mm -hmm. people. But that self confidence was instilled in me from the time I was a very little girl. And it was like, you can do anything you like. And well, my parents would say that and they'd say, you know, whatever you need, um, you know, we'll help you. No, I knew I wasn't going to be a rocket scientist because I can't add two and two and get four, right? But in my head, <laughs> it, it was like, yeah. <laughs> no, really, your dad's got the math genes. <laughs> I don't have that. Um, but, you know, it's, I think the reason that people change, and I call it chameleon-like behavior, is they're not bringing with them their best self, and they're not bringing with them that, that self-confidence. Even if you only got a little thimble full, bring it with you and say, mm -hmm. I have the courage and the confidence to be me today even though everybody else at the mm -hmm. table might look different, behave different, have different backgrounds, have more money than you, whatever, it doesn't really matter. You bring your best self to wherever you are. And if it's a board table, and um, I've always had the courage to do that. 
because I think Wask, Wasker, yeah, Oscar Wilde had a great quote, and it's not, this is not correct, but it's something like always be yourself because everybody else is taken. Mm -hmm. And it's so true, you know, it's like, why would, why would I want to be somebody else, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like my mother said, they want to be you and they can't, I can't be somebody else. I don't want to be somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And before I preface, I want to preface this question by saying that Pippi and I are very, very proud to be from New Brunswick. You know, it's incredible that such a small province has given both of us the opportunities that we've had. And I'm very proud to be from New Brunswick. And at one point I see myself going back there. It's unparalleled, the people, um, you know, the, the access to opportunity that sometimes other folks, especially Central and Western Canada don't perceive as being there. But do you see in what situation would New Brunswick have a female premier? What would have to happen? Would it be, do you think, do you think New Brunswick could right now elect a female premier? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that that's, um, that's an absolute possibility. And I would hope that someday I will see that. I mean, if you look at today's government that we have, uh, there are, I think, more female members than ever. And we have mm -hmm. several female ministers. And um, uh, I, I think the thing about political becoming involved in politics is whether you're a man or a woman, it has to be something that appeals to you, that you feel you have the ability to bring your best self to, that you're committed to, and that you have to be prepared to, you know, be in the limelight. And being in the limelight doesn't mean that people are always going to say nice things about you. Mm -hmm. No. And, uh, but absolutely. And, you know, I, I, New Brunswick has, has been in the limelight in the last year to me, it's always been in the limelight because I, I chose to, to <laughs> live here, even though I had opportunities elsewhere. Um, because of, because of COVID and, and the way that we dealt with it early on, and I think are still doing well, um, but, and some people say, well, you know, people want to live in the Maritimes because of the, you know, the, the lifestyle and all that. Um, mm -hmm. I actually don't think that's entirely true. That may be part of it. I think in, you know, part of this health thing and being safe and, and whatever, I understand that in the last year. But I think overall, um, it's the opportunity to really value and appreciate. I mean, I'm a very, very values driven person. Uh, most of the, everything I do is based on some value. So and even when I do work, strategic planning work, and I have a model that I developed um, uh, for mainly not for profits. We start very early on by looking at the values that individuals have and the values that um, the organization have. And I mm -hmm. think New Brunswick is grounded in a, a wonderful value system. Um, and uh, I, I'm hoping that that will always carry it through. Um, I believe that uh, the opportunities here are endless. No, you may not, you know, the, the salaries may not be as high as they are in other cities, but there's a whole bunch of socioeconomic factors that play into that, right? But um, um, as far as a female premier, absolutely. Mm 